right, you've got to be very scared. You don't know whether this thing is going to bite you or not. You don't, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. And uh, thank you so much for everybody uh, inviting me over so that we can talk about how to be able to take care of some of these patients. These are vulnerable patients. These are young patients. These are patients who have no choice. It's like you and me, right? You wake up first thing in the morning, you're driving your car to work, or you're cycling your bicycle here in Graz, isn't it? Eh? Some silly man with his car bumps you. Okay, all right. And you find yourself in a hospital. Can you imagine what that does to your families when they receive that phone call to say you've been hit by a car? It's the most terrifying thing. At the same time, the parents will be so worried, who is going to take care of my child? Yes. Okay. And this is why I thought this kind of talk will kind of help you and build you. I know you are very young people when it comes to university training, and some of you are already qualified, just qualified. But believe me, you're still young. Okay. Like David says, I'm a trauma surgeon, uh, originally from South Africa. Uh, qualified a specialist, subspecialist in trauma surgery care. Now, before I get into the topic itself in detail, the way you treat trauma patients or the way trauma is addressed in Europe is different from the way the South Africans do it, the Americans do it, and Canadians do it. Okay. When you speak of traumatology in Europe, you're talking of orthopedic surgeon. Right. We agree? Yes, a traumatologist in Europe is an orthopedic surgeon. Now, a traumatologist in South Africa and the Americans is a person who deals with trauma to the viscera. Okay, in other words, any injury from the neck, okay, all right, all the way down to the knees, if you could vascular trauma, okay, we do not call a vascular surgeon. I do it myself, all right. You've got visceral injury to the belly, to the heart, okay? Vessels in the neck, okay? This is what we do. And that's what I'm going to be talking about, okay? Trolley trauma patient who is basically not only orthopedics, but the stabbed hearts, okay? All right? Stabbed uh, colon, small bowel, pancreas, spleen. Do we understand each other? All right, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Now, the World Health Organization has put a trauma to be one of the most avoidable causes of mortality and morbidity throughout the world. Now, these are the figures that were given around 2004 and revised in 2010. Okay, I, st I still believe that, we, that the figures are more than that for a simple reason, of what's happening, what's happening in the Middle East, okay? I don't think there are figures coming from there. Not as yet, okay? Only 10 years down the line, probably we're gonna be getting the true figures of the impact of trauma on innocent, young, healthy, economically viable people, okay? So that's the figure we have of a third, all right? What is the etiology of trauma? In other words, what causes trauma? Okay. These, some of these pictures are actually real. Okay. This is a picture from Chris Anibaraguanov. Okay. I think I might have shown it before, the, time, the last time I was here. This is actually a real patient in real life. Okay. Homicide, multiple stabs. Huh? Can you see that? Okay. Then you also have a patient with a precordial stab. So this patient I took to theater actually had a stabbed heart, okay, very young patient, right. and likely, of course, he, he survived, okay. You can have motor vehicle crashes, all right, okay. These are all etiologies of trauma. Now, what makes this polytrauma patient special? Remember what I said, young and healthy person riding his bicycle to work or uh, to school, like you guys here in Graz, and get hit by a car. What's so special about is from the impact when you hit by a car, 
the type of care you are going to receive, okay? The initial care does change the outcome. If you have people fiddling around with you on scene, on the area of an accident, instead of deciding on taking you to a proper place, eh? not just a clinic, all right? You don't want to find a polytrauma patient in a uh, GP's rooms, eh? a private office where the doctor works. You want to take that patient to a proper setup. So the golden hour is extremely important. I know it's argumentative. People say, no, it doesn't really matter. Believe me, from the experience we have in South Africa and in Americas, it does matter. The more time you play with these patients, the more you're going to lose them. So that golden hour is really, really critical, okay? But like I said, you will get people who are controversial when it comes to that issue. And as far as my experience is concerned, to me it matters. So every time I receive a phone call from the helicopter service, I say, listen, doc, we have a polytrauma patient who has this and this and this. Then I say to them, fly that patient as fast as you can. Don't fiddle around. Or I would say to them, do this and do this and don't waste time. It does matter. Okay. What makes this patient special? Pre-hospital care, I've emphasized in that. There's so many teams of people who get involved in trying to manage this patient. There's lots of people around where the accident is. There's a police, okay? So you can imagine the sense of agency of everybody trying to help. That's polytrauma patient. And that's why they're special. And what gets involved in as far as the crashes? It's not just traumatic brain injury, yeah? It's also long bone injuries, okay, all right? With possible compromised vasculature to that particular limb. If you fiddle around with an open wound like that, you never know, okay? The vessels might be hurt and that patient might end up having an amputation. So you gotta know what you're doing. And not just that, okay? There could be a flail segment, ventilatory issues, a cardio pulmonary ventilatory issues with blood in the chest and possibly pneumothorax. This is not the patient that you can treat on scene, isn't it? And this is not the patient that can be treated in any hospital. That patient needs a proper unit. Pelvic fractures with spine. Okay. Those patients need specialized care. Now, what makes an ideal trauma unit? Because like I said, you guys are going to be doctors soon, and you probably want to be surgeons, some of you. Also want to practice trauma surgery, okay? What's an ideal unit? Now, an ideal unit should have a trauma surgeon, okay? Not probably somebody like me, all right, okay? Not just an orthopedic surgeon, all right? And it should be relatively be a level one center where the experience and the resources are adequate enough to take care of that particular patient. It doesn't make sense to take a patient with traumatic, close traumatic brain injury, all right, where there's no, no, no neurosurgeon, eh? Does, it doesn't really make sense, does it? No, it doesn't, okay. So you want a super specialized unit where there are multidisciplinary people around, huh? okay? You got a neurosurgeon, Sometimes a vascular surgeon, you know, but you need to have interventional radiology interventionists, okay? Something that you can fix operatively. You can get somebody who can address it non-invasively or less invasively rather, okay? It's got to be a high volume center where high volume center translates to experience. Where I come from, Chris Anibaraguanath, we see so many trauma patients every day, okay? So this is why the experience translates to most clinical good outcomes. All right, okay. And of course, you've got to have a blood bank on site, right? There's no doubt about it. And you've got to have a theater that's readily available. So if you find yourself, and of course, you've got to have a, a critical care unit, ICU, where these patients will go to, okay? For what I will explain to you later on. If you find yourself working in a unit like this, that's Chris and Baraguanath over there, okay? If you find yourself in a unit like this, the outcome of those patients is way better. Okay, it's good. All right, in other words, patients will walk out of that hospital and go home and spend time with their families. No matter how injured they are, 
When you finish school, okay, when you become a doctor, we strongly advise you, okay, to indulge yourself in emergency care experience or courses, okay. Advanced trauma life support, I'm not really promoting it, okay, but it's something that I really believe that each one of you needs to know, okay. Advanced trauma life support is an emergency course that I personally believe anybody who qualifies as a doctor or even a nurse or a paramedic should go through. Can you imagine finding yourself on scene and you don't know what to do? You actually cause more harm than damage. So these are some of the courses that we strongly advise that when you guys finish, even observe, okay? I think you guys do DSTC here, Definite Surgical uh, Training Course here in Graz. It is worthwhile you contact uh, Professor Uranus, okay? When this is happening, just pop in so that you can see what they do, okay? It's the same principle, all right? So any approach to any trauma patient, it's got to be along these lines for a simple reason that I'm going to go through, that you will understand what I'm talking about. And it is important when you're seeing, when you know how to imply, how to employ these kind of uh, parameters or help, guidelines, okay, it will help you triage patients when you're on scene. You decide what to do on scene and you decide which hospital to take this patient. All right. Now, for everything that you do for that particular patient, from scene, okay, to a hospital, Okay, there's an end point of it, isn't it? The eventual end point is to say this patient gets discharged to going home, okay? But it's a process, all right? What are the targets? What are the parameters? When you're putting a drip on a patient, an IV line on a patient, how much fluid should you give, eh? All right. When do you decide to take that patient to theater, okay? Advanced trauma life support guidelines. Okay, like I say, this is important. You need this, okay? It teaches everybody to be able to look at the airway, the mnemonic, which is basically A, B, C, D, E, as you can see there, right? So the A, okay, would say, you gotta look at the airway of this particular person. So you find the patient lying on the side of the road, okay? You want to be able to talk to that patient, all right? If the patient is not talking, is unconscious, what do you do next? You decide whether to get a definitive airway, all right? In other words, intubate the patient or call for help, eh? all right? While you do a jaw thrust maneuver to just keep the mouth open and hopefully that patient will breathe, okay? And it is important as well with whatever you do initially is to protect the spine at all times, okay? So you protect the spine the spine, what we call inline immobilization. And the next thing, you assess the patient, find out the patient is breathing or not, and importantly, you feel for a radio pulse, okay? If you feel a radio pulse, it simply says to you, this patient is perfusing. Their heart is beating, okay? There's blood flowing around to at least sustain that brain. At the same time, having done that, you also assess, like when you talk to the patient, you want to see if the patient can respond to you, can tell you appropriate words, can remember what's happened. Usually they don't remember, okay? Whether they're concussed, okay? They don't remember. But they might remember their name, okay? So you assess the severity of central, you know, central brain injury, okay? What we call a Glasgow Coma Scale. The next thing you want to look at the environment, okay? Around the patient, is the patient's clothes soaked in blood? Is it cold, okay? For a simple reason that cold patients don't do very well, okay? So it's either you undress the patient, put pressure where the bleeding is, and cover them with something warm, okay? Until you get next help. So like I've already said, decision to decide where you're going to intubate this patient. And how do you do the intubation? In other words, get a definitive airway. All right? You don't need anesthetist for that. Okay? You don't need anesthetist for that. We, we will train you to do that because we do this ourselves. Okay? Anesthetist stay in theater. All right. Okay. Then rapid sequence intubation, which is one of the principles that is used. Okay? You use a sedative 
an opioid and a paralyzing agent, okay? So that you're able to slide in the airway into this particular patient. And you have to get an access, in other words, an IV line, okay? You decide whether you have a bigger line, a thick big line, so that you can infuse as fast as you can, whatever you're giving. We recommend blood, obviously, okay? You don't want to take an hour to infuse blood. So you want something thick, as you can see there, what we call high cap lines, all right? And these lines obviously done in a cell dinger technique. Okay, that you learn. Nowadays we have ultrasound, and I'm sure Simon and his team are gonna show you how to access central lines using an ultrasound. Okay, as good as it is, okay? For trauma surgeon like me, there's no time. Okay, all right, okay. It's usually for patients who are very stable and patient was already in theater, but it's a good modality to be familiar with, okay? And while you're doing that, you draw bloods and decide whether this patient's gonna need emergency blood, okay? You compact them and get ready for theater. This is all primary survey, okay? You log roll the patients, you've got a patient with you, make sure you've got support and everybody helps you log roll the patient onto the side and look at the back. You remember those tabs that we saw initially, the initial scan, the initial slide. You saw that that was a log roll onto the side so that you can look at the back, okay? If a patient is awake, then you also feel for the spine, all right? If it's tender, if it's boggy, you know, those, those, those features we help you. And then you also ask the patient if they can move their toes or, you know, lower limbs just to assess a neurological fallout. Okay. You also do what you call digital rectal exam. Okay. A digital rectal exam is to assess an autone. It's a patient who's got spine injury. Okay. They can't move the lower limbs. You want to assess the bubble effect. You know, preservation of an autone simply means it's a good thing, okay? Please protect the spine, all right? You also wanna look at uh, contraindication of putting a Foley's catheter in a patient, all right? And one of them is a high riding prostate. So if you feel, you're putting your finger on the backside and you feel that the prostate is high raised, okay? That's an absolute contraindication in putting a Foley's catheter because it says the urethra is torn. Okay, so you do not pass a catheter. You also look for blood, okay? If you find blood on the glove, on the tip of the glove, that would be a sign to say, listen, there is a pelvic injury, potentially urethral injury. So do not pass a catheter in that patient, okay? All right. Now, what are the agents? What investigations do we do for this patient, your initial assessment, which I've already summarized now, what we call primary survey, okay? Standardly, a patient gets a chest x-ray, okay? Overhead chest x-ray. You don't need to wait for a radiologist to come from far. Always we have overhead x-rays. So you do a chest, then you also do a pelvic x-ray, okay? This will help you decide whether you are going to decompress the chest if you find a, say, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax, okay? Then with a the pelvic x-ray, we help you if a patient remains unstable, okay? And you, you, you can't, you, you wonder where this patient is bleeding from, okay? And you start thinking, well, there could be pelvic fractures with their aliosacral, okay, vessel injuries, then they bleed in the back, but inside, okay, retroperitoneally, okay? Then you decide whether to put a bind on this patient or not, okay? And impressively, not long ago, it's almost, I think, a decade, eh? it's almost a decade, I think, now, that we have ultrasounds, all right, okay? EFAST, what we call an extended focus assessment sonography in trauma, okay? This has changed our lives. Believe me, when I was training as a, as a surgeon, we had no access to this, okay? Now, for the past few years, it's completely changed how you make a diagnostic approach in a patient who's bleeding in the abdomen. Instead of waiting to go to theater, okay, instead of waiting to take the patient for a CT scan, okay, if you have to, all right, or doing what you call a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, which I'll explain to you what it means. So initially in my training, we used to do that, these two, okay, then we'll do a DPL, 
a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, which is a small, small little operation, okay? But it takes time to make a diagnosis of a patient who's bleeding in the belly. And fast, believe me, has changed things, okay? Because this is a, something that you do on site of the patient, and it takes five minutes, if not less, okay? With all these probes that you have to try and find when injured, actually with this, then you know you 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 would identify the patient is bleeding in the belly within the pelvis, right upper quadrant, okay, in the Morrison's pouch, as well as subphrenic on the left side, just below the diaphragm, okay, between the diaphragm and the spleen, all right. Then you can also make a diagnostic uh, diagnosis of any cardiac injury and specifically penetrating to the heart, whether you have um, hemopericardium, okay then you can actually take the patient to theater instead of waiting for a cardiologist and everything else like that. So things are getting better every day, okay? Now, just briefly slide back, this is a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, okay? So this is the patient's head over there, okay? This is the patient's head on that side, and this is where the pelvis is. This is your umbilicus, all right? So you have what you call a Seldinger technique, the one that we use to put a central line, okay? Where you have this needle, you make a small little incision just below the navel, huh? so to call it the navel and the umbilicus, all right? Then you put this needle in, okay? Then you're forcing the, what we call a guide wire, okay? You're pushing the guide wire towards the pelvis, all right? You leave the guide wire, you take that needle out and you put your catheter. Okay, and you aspirate. That's obviously a positive DPL. That patient needs theater. Now, if you compare that with what you do with an ultrasound, essentially that, can you see the difference? It's advancement, isn't it? We are grown. Instead of exposing a patient to that risk, okay, now we're doing a EFOST and you can make a decision to take the patient to theater. So this is the generation that you guys are falling into. DPL is still helpful for somebody like me, but I think for you guys, it's no longer helpful for obvious reasons. What's the treatment for a patient who's bleeding? Is stop the bleeding. Okay, all right. This is where this issue of controversy is coming up that should we be giving lots of fluids to this patient? Should we be giving Ringer's lactate? I don't know what you call it here. You know? Hartman's, I think you call it Hartman's here. Right. Should we be giving normal saline? Things are changing that a patient who's bleeding, polytrauma patients, by definition of polytrauma patient, that patient is bleeding until proven otherwise. Okay. You need to stop the bleeding. But the process of stopping that bleeding at the same time trying to compensate that the patient does not deteriorate to die, what do you give them? Okay. When you've done your primary survey, all right, it's important because you've low growth the patient, remember? You've done your primary survey, you low growth the patient, you turn the patient back, and suppose you've intubated this patient. There's always a risk that when you turn them back, the tube might dislodge, okay? Lines might pull out because everybody's trying to help, okay? It's important to repeat your primary survey. In other words, A, B, C, D. All right, look at the airway, okay? Is ventilation good? Both sides of the lungs, okay? Are your lines in, okay? Is the saturation still good while you resuscitate the patient before you go what we call a secondary survey? What's a secondary survey? It's basically examining a patient from the head to toe. Because your initial assessment, you're worried about things that will kill a patient immediately. Okay? Raccoon eyes won't kill the patient immediately, but a compromised airway would kill the patient. Do you all agree? Yes, okay. A low blood pressure would kill the patient first before a patient with raccoon eyes. Okay, so you're examining the patient all the way from the scalp, okay? If a patient is bleeding, say, from the scalp, because you could lose the entire volume of five liters from the scalp, you apply hemostatic suturing. There's no time to go to theater. Let's go and suture in theater. Immediately, you apply hemostatic suturing, okay? This is a sign to say this patient has got 
best of scar injury, okay? You gotta think of a neurological injury, a brain injury, okay? So the base of scar might be fractured, okay? Beto sign, rhinorrhea, in other words, you got CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, coming out through the nose, okay? That's a sign of severity to brain injury. You look at the risk, you look at potentially what you call flare chest, Desynchrony in breathing or movement of the chest, okay, which would suggest that part of the chest cavity is actually dissociated from the rest of the body, okay, that compromises ventilation. If a patient is fully awake, they would complain of abdominal pain, what you call an acute abdomen, right? You also look for a seatbelt sign. If a patient has got a seatbelt, for instance, this lady here, you can see there's a seatbelt sign on the left, okay? That patient may have a vascular injury in the neck, okay? Vascular injury in the chest, all right? So you don't just look at it. You need to investigate that patient, even if they're very stable, okay? This patient will probably end up having an angiogram, a CT angiogram, looking at the neck vessels, as well as the mediastinal structures. Do not assume that's fine if the patient is talking to you. You also get to think of spine injury, hey? Deceleration, acceleration injuries because of that. So you have to assess the spine quite extensively. Unstable pelvis, perineal examination, important. And of course, feel for any perfusion distally. In other words, your extremities. Is the, is the patient perfusing from their extremities as well? Now, in your secondary survey, what investigations do you do? All right, okay. You decide whether you're going to do a computer tomography scan, okay, for this patient. Are you going to, are you going to, you know, to examine the head? Are you going to do the, do the neck? Or are you just going to do everything, okay? Now, we are in the phase of people being sued every day, okay? That clinical examination techniques is being lost because people are very afraid, or physicians are afraid of being sued. So you get a patient being scanned, everything. Unfortunately, in South Africa, the reality was to practice that strictness because we don't have the luxury of scans, all right? So you make a decision with your clinical experience, okay? And be able to defend yourself, all right? You don't just scan everything, all right? Okay, so you make that decision of we're going to do a pen scan on this patient. Then in geography, if you think there's a vascular compromise in this particular patient, then you do an angiography. Okay, now a tag is basically just a modality that assess coagulopathy. Polytrauma patients are prone to bleed. The more you give them fluids, they become coagulopathic. In other words, they do not clot. The continual bleeding. That's an investigation that we also use. You decide whether to do an ultrasound to assess the vessels and potentially an MRI, but rarely would do an MRI in an emergency setting. Now, while you're assessing this patient, it takes time, isn't it? You're talking about probably about 30 minutes, okay? If there's any change of condition for that particular patient while you're assessing them properly, You've got to be very versatile. You need to decide if the patient needs theater immediately, okay? Don't confine yourself to doing a primary survey. Say, I, I have to finish the primary survey. I have to log roll this patient. Otherwise, you lose a patient. If a patient deteriorates immediately, you go back and have a look. I think I, think I know where this patient is bleeding from. It's a blunt trauma. The, the pelvis is very unstable. The chest looks clear. I think this patient is bleeding from abdomen, all right? Take the patient to theater. Now, this is where this principle is coming out recently, what we call damage control. Having assessed this patient, you have to decide the severity of the injuries on the patient, all right? Is this patient bleeding or is stopped or is it still bleeding, all right? It's important to repeat a fast always, okay? Assess the abdomen, and you, tell, you ask yourself, I've given, say, a liter of fluids. Is he responded very well? Is he, res is he a rapid responder? In other words, his blood pressure seems to kind of normalize. He's behaving well. Eh? There's no rush in doing anything more. Or is he a moderate exp you know, re responder? You give him fluids, he settles for a few minutes, then he crashes. 
Okay. Or whatever, whatever you're doing is not responding. So you give, say, two units of blood, you do everything, is not responding. So that patient belongs to what? To theatre, usually. Okay? That patient going for surgery. Forget CT scan, forget everything else. Straight to theatre and deal with whatever you have to find. You need to go and stop the bleeding. All right. And I always say this to students and registrars that a non-responder does not go to a radiology suite. Okay? You do not say, this patient has been stepped to the abdomen. I'm not sure what I should do with this patient, but I would like to have a CT scan. And just to be sure that this knife has penetrated into the abdomen, that patient goes to theater. You're also being brought up in a world now that we practice damage control resuscitation. Damage control resuscitation, the slide says it, is basically a technique, okay, of permissive hypotension, I'll explain to you very shortly, and hemostatic resuscitation and damage control surgery. Child, one step back, gone are the days when, when a patient, for instance, has got multiple stabs into the abdomen, okay, with pancreatic injury, colonic injury. Gone are the days when people used to fix everything, do the initial surgery then, all right, okay, and close the abdomen and wait and see how this patient is doing. Those days are gone, okay. In an unstable patient who has bled out, so what we do now is basically to rush the patient to theater, okay, stop the bleeding, if it means tying off the vessels or putting a shunt on that particular vessel, that's what you do. And as far as injuries to the colon, the small bubble, we just tie off so that it does not leak into the abdomen and wash the abdomen. We leave the abdomen open, okay, and we continue with the resuscitation while in ICU. After 24 to 72 hours, okay, during that process of resuscitation, you see how the patient is responding to resuscitation. Only then you bring him back, okay, and do a definitive procedure. So when you visit us, when you visit us in Vancouver, or visit us in South Africa, do not be surprised when see open abdomens after surgery immediately. It has been proven, modality, it has been shown in Iraq war, Afghanistan, okay, even South Africa initially in Cape Town and Johannesburg, that if you do abbreviated surgery, the outcome in this patient is good. They do well. Okay, all right, they do well. For simple reasons I'll explain to you just now. Before you decide to do damage control, there are certain predictors. The patient comes into trauma and you're like, you know what, I don't think I'll be able to do an obvious operation and finish on the same sitting for this patient because this patient is unstable. What do you mean by that? A patient who comes hypothermic, temperature of less than 35, whatever you do in theater, that patient is at risk. If you do a definitive procedure, okay, that patient will decompensate later. Okay, so you have to do damage control. The pH, which is a sign of perfusion, obviously, right? A best deficit of more than minus, uh, it's actually supposed to be more than, okay, more than fif minus 15, all right? A lactate of more than five millimoles per liter, okay? And patient who's had massive transfusion, MTs, massive transfusion is defined as giving at least more than 10 pints of blood on a go sitting, that patient should not have a definitive procedure, okay? You stop everything that you're doing, okay? If you're trying to fix the vessel, stop it because you're going to waste time, okay? And wasting time on the patient on the table, they get cold, okay? The acidosis gets worse because they do not perfuse. Believe me, this is the future. This is what is happening. Now, we perform damage control surgery. 
We do not do definitive procedures for patients who are unstable. You're doing everything, eh? All right, you're doing everything. How far can you go? And what are the targets? How do you tell yourself the patient is doing well? Okay, these are the parameters that you need to look at. Okay, if you guys start reading in you know, critical care journals, you will constantly hear repetition of this type of slide. I'm going to be happy if my patient's mean arterial pressure, okay, is above 65 millimeters per mercury, provided that patient doesn't have a traumatic brain injury. A patient who's got a traumatic brain injury needs to have a mean arterial pressure between 80 and 90. Now, what comes with that? You're trying to achieve that blood pressure. The patient is bled out. You don't just give stuff, okay? These are the patients you probably will have to start giving inotropes, okay? This is the patient you might give vasopressors, adrenaline, eh? phenylephrine, okay? And remember, these are not the drugs that we like in trauma because they worsen the acidosis. So catch 22. So you have to be an institute in taking care of these patients. I want a patient whose heart rate gets better, less than 100 beats per minute. I don't want 120, which is obviously a sign of hemorrhagic shock, bleeding. All right. Best axis should be less than minus 3. All right. A lactate should come down from 5 to at least about two, all right? Your central, your mixed central venous oxygenation, all right? You want it above 70. If it's less than 70, that patient is in trouble, okay? And of course, later on, we always say urine output has to be optimal, 0 0.5 cc per kg per hour. The patient should be able to be passing urine. And of course, the temperature has to be better. Cold patients do not clot. I know the guys were in South Africa. She was in South Africa with us. And Simon, I kept asking, what's a lethal triad? Lethal triad of trauma. Any polytrauma patient you, who comes to a unit, you have to assume they are coagulopathic for a simple reason that usually they're not perfusing OK, and they have an acidosis, OK? And usually they're cold. So if you have a combination of these three, that patient has got a 99% chance of dying if you do not correct those, let alone surgery. Because if you take a patient like this to theater, okay, there's actually most, most I think, 100% chance that patient will die. So during your process of resuscitation, you need to make sure you try your levels best to warm this patient. So whatever you're giving this patient has to be warm. You have to give them warm blood, okay, warm fluids, when the patient is lying on a stretcher in theater, you have to have what you call bear huggers, lots of towels, cover the head. Where, so everything that you're not operating on, okay, needs to be covered so they can warm these patients. Have a good core temperature. Core temperature of above 36 is the best. Platelets don't function when you're cold. Acidotic, okay, they do not work. So you could give as many platelets as you want. Patient like that does not clot. Okay? So you have coagulation factors being absorbed, being consumed, because you're giving cold fluids, and the patient is already cold. All right. The mental status won't improve. Okay? Neurologically, you know, you're killing the brain. Okay? You also you have a situation where they suppress cardiac output because the cardiovasculature doesn't work when the patient is cold, acidotic, and coagulopathic. And there's no response to whatever catecholamines you're giving. In other words, you're giving them adrenaline, phenylephrine, doesn't work. Doesn't. So I think this whole summary says to you, from scene into hospital, casualty, any unit, okay, you need to try and avoid these as much as you can before you even take this patient to theater. Now, the adjuncts that we do in patients who basically are like, oh, okay, this resuscitation is going well, okay, we're doing well, but yeah, let's do this. 
If a patient has got an open wound, okay, it's always recommended that you give them prophylactic antibiotics, okay, depending what unit you're in. Okay? We normally give penicillins. Okay? Then in a patient who's got blunt trauma to the abdomen, they're bleeding, you suspect they're bleeding into the abdomen, you're giving them fluids and everything else, it's important to also give them antifibronitic agents, tranexamic acid, because cyclocarbon. Okay. It must just come up to your head, part of resuscitation. Okay. Hemosorvix, these are blood products to try and promote coagulation. If you suspect the patient has got traumatic brain injury, prophylactic, prophylactic treatment in as far as uh, seizures is concerned, which you normally give for seven days, and of course, controversially, in a patient whom you think the patient has got severe brain injury, they're corning, okay, raised pressures in the brain, the pupil is dilated on one side, you haven't even scanned them, eh? you're waiting to go and get, do a scan to try and find, but you see those signs, then you have to give what's called central diuretics, a manitol, okay, does change outcome. Then you scan the patient and you decide whether the patient needs an infusion to be continued or needs surgery to try and drain that extradural bleed. So, we're talking about the patient from theater. From the, th from the theater, the patient goes to ICU with an open abdomen. Remember what you said? Damage control surgery, huh? Okay? You leave abdomen open with that fancy dressing we called a negative pressure dressing. It's called a vac dressing, okay? Negative pressure dressing. Or it could be the same patient or another patient next to him, okay? who hasn't really had, who's been intubated, possibly has got traumatic brain injury. But the point here is not to stop your resuscitation, okay, until the next surgery, which is usually this case, okay? Relook surgery within 24, 72 hours, where you continue to resuscitate the patient, all right? Because you have done your initial surgery, which is abbreviated, okay? While in ICU, it is important to continue assessing them, both the respiratory and ventilatory support. What are the gases looking like, okay? What is the PCO2? What is the oxygenation levels, okay? Is the acidosis getting worse, okay? If the acidosis is getting worse, is this patient not perfusing? Is, this, is there ongoing bleeding, all right? You need to constantly ask yourself this. In other words, you have taken the patient to theater, but you might have missed something, okay? Or the patient has gone so coagulopathic that they have what you call non-surgical bleeding, all right? Is there a point of taking this patient to theater? Or, unfortunately, we cannot salvage this patient. These are the ongoing resuscitative modalities that everybody needs to do on this particular patient. And it goes on for days. It goes on to sometimes about three days, like say 72 hours, okay? Neural protection care as a target. If you think the patient has got traumatic brain injury, you do not wait for the neurosurgeon huh? to say, you know what, do this, do this, do this. We will teach you, okay? And if you do ATLS, we'll teach you to say, you need to intubate this patient, and what are the targets when you're intubating the patient? What are the gases that you need to do? We we'll always say, you need oxygenation that's optimal to perfuse that brain, isn't it? Okay, to feed that brain. You need to get rid of carbon dioxide so that if carbon dioxide accumulates, the brain swells, the vessels dilate, okay? You need to constantly monitor and meet those targets. Correct an acidosis, like I said, is an ongoing bleeding. Is the acidosis getting worse that you might need to take the patient back to theater, okay? I've already spoken about the correction of the lethal triad during resuscitation, okay? That's in ICU, both ICU and theater. You need to constantly do that. Real look laparotomy, just to start track a bit, open abdomens, we would normally, if they're bleeding in the belly, we would put packs, abdominal swabs, okay? to put pressure on whatever bleeding is, then we cover them, okay? So you take them back to theater and remove those packs. While you're assessing them, you know, you take the pack out and see if they continue to bleed or not, whether you can correct anything. Usually, if you've done things properly, there are things that I've already explained here, okay? If you do it properly, okay? In other words, the acidosis gets better, all right? They are warm, 
very unlikely that they'll continue to bleed. Okay, so you take the pick out, okay, and you can close the abdomen, all right, and start winning off your support, start waking the patient up, okay. Conclusion, that was fast, yeah, okay. It is, trauma is the leading cause of mortality and morbidity, and, and the reality is it affects the, the young, like, you know, you guys, and the very economically driven young. And remember what I say, cycling your bicycle, you're going to school or you're going to work, okay? And you meet this eventful event, okay? Where there's a risk, probably you lose your leg, you get a severe traumatic brain injury. This is the truth about trauma. And this is how sad it is, okay? Because some of it can be avoided. And you're also looking at you guys. It's important when you qualify to be able to be familiar or be able to do these courses, okay? So that you can prime yourself on approaching trying to take care of these trauma patients. Gone are the days when we used to do definitive surgery, okay, in these patients. We do what's called damage control resuscitation. Damage control resuscitation, in other words, take the patient to theater, stop the bleeding, stop the contamination. Don't do definitive procedures, okay? Then after that, take the patient to ICU, resuscitate them. Once they're relatively stable, you take, in, you take them back to theater and do definitive procedure, okay? It's always important that when you have a patient on the road, okay, you decide whether this patient is going to a level one trauma unit where there's every support for that, that particular patient. You don't want to take a patient to, like I said before, there's no neurosurgeon, there's no orthopedic surgeon. It doesn't make sense, does it? Where there's no ICU. So you need to know, you need to be familiar with your environment around where you work so they can take this patient to an appropriate center and preferably a level one center. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you as well, Dr. Mugabe. Are there any questions? Yeah, there's one. We need a microphone back there, please. Thank you very much for the talk. I just have one question. Well, I guess if you correct, if you want to correct acidosis, you could do something about hypoxia and hypoperfusion, but is there any other procedure you would do to try to correct this acidosis? Remember the, the causes of acidosis in polytrauma patients, it's usually hypoperfusion, right? And what do you mean by hypoperfusion? It could be actually more of a metabolic, okay? Or uh, a respiratory, okay? But believe me, polytrauma patients, it's usually a metabolic to do with hypovolemia. They are bled out, okay? So the best way to correct that, okay? I know you're gonna ventilate them, make sure the PCO2 and PO2 the respiratory part is corrected. That's not an issue. It's usually the metabolic hypovolemic part of thing. You replace whatever they have lost. At the same time, you stop the bleeding. That would correct that acidosis. Okay. So, any other questions? Anyone on the web conference has a question? Well, looks good. Thank you. A uh, little thank you oh. as you've come here in your free time, even paid thank for you. your own flights and everything. It's a few thank local you. products. Thank you so much. Huh? At Appreciate least something to take here. Thank you. Thanks Appreciate for it. The, thank thanks you. for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.